Great, thanks, Kevin. So today I'll, I'll give a brief overview, really, in, in terms of an interview, kind of what employers are looking for data-wise and how they're actually using that data to drive analytics to make the interview process a little bit different to what people would have been used to. So maybe just to talk through first, maybe just a little bit of my own background so you can see where I've been coming from and understand my, I suppose, um, knowledge from this perspective. So from an education perspective, Bachelor of Commerce in Cork in UCC, followed by HDIP in Computer Science, then working for a lot of the big, big uh, companies around here, started with Musgraves, JBA Software, EMC, and then uh, Dell Technologies. Um, now, also back in UCC, I'm studying for my executive MBA. Other big thing for, from an interview perspective and from a culture and experience perspective is about where you've worked and experiencing different cultures. So kind of working in, starting in Cork, working in Dublin, working in Birmingham, Freiburg, back to Cork, over to Boston, and now back in Cork for the last three years as well. It's all about picking up little bits around the different cultures, interviews, and all different practices. Passions, obviously, family, outdoor, everything to do with, with Cork, a big affinity to. So we'll start with data, and data is ingrained in everything we do. Everyone here has a smartphone, everyone here probably has a smart watch. And when you think about how everything is captured from a data perspective, we know how much Facebook, how much Google has, it's actually nearly gigabytes of data on each individual person they have. So they use that. And companies use that as well. So companies use Google Analytics to, to get more information in terms of what you're doing, kind of what you've done previously. So part of that also stems back into recruitment. And I think the big one that people would have noticed first, especially around recruitment, was Moneyball uh, by Michael Lewis. So I think people are probably more familiar with the Brad Pitt movie, but Michael Lewis worked with the Oakland A's in baseball in the States. And they started using data and analytics to recruit the best players. So they started taking statistics and driving those analytics to say who would be the best player in each position. And modern day companies are now doing the exact same. They're using the data and analytics to determine who would be the best fit in terms of skills, in terms of culture, and in terms of fit. So that's kind of where you see where it's all coming from. Obviously now all the major sports companies uh, and teams are doing the exact same. The one thing from a company perspective though, it's a lot harder to spot the next kind of Messi or Mbappe because not everything we do is recorded, or is it? Sorry, my clicker is uh, done. So, first thing is, what, why are companies using um, data and analytics today? So, it is a candidate's market. You can see today between 40 different vendors uh, trying to get people to, uh, to join the companies. It really is uh, the, the, the candidate's market. So, I'll deep dive a little bit more into that as well. But the next big thing they want to do is get a competitive advantage. So, because it's a, a, a candidate's market, they now have to do something different to attract the right talent. So any little nugget they can get, anything they can differentiate on, will give them that competitive advantage. The next big thing is the cost of a bad hire. So if you do hire the wrong person, it's going to cost maybe 30% of salary is a conservative estimate. And on top of that then, you've got your employee morale, you've got the rest of the team, how they've also been impacted. Other big thing here, and you can see it again with all, all, the, all the vendors here, companies want to be the employer of choice. It's all about the brand from a company perspective. People want to work, if you're coming out of college as a graduate, you probably have three or four companies that you think you want to work for. You want to work maybe consulting, you want to work in a, a McKinsey, a Bain, or a BCG. If you want to work in technology, maybe it's a Dell, it's a Facebook, it's an Amazon. But it's all about the brand, and that's why companies do a lot to actually protect that brand and be, try to become an employer of choice.
clicker. I'll build it out to be quicker. So the other part, obviously, is improving the hiring process. So again, hiring, as with any other process, is an end-to-end -end process. So in terms of starting with the job, the job uh, spec, all the way through the applications, all the way through the interviews, through the hiring, the final hiring process. So you have to do everything you can to try and improve that. So you're gathering data every step of the way to see what you can do better. And the last piece is all around profiling. So companies want to know the profile of the people that they've hired, but then subsequently they want to see how successful those people are. So whether it's in terms of performance, whether it's in terms of culture fit. So then when they come back again, they can say, okay, candidates A, B, and C were all successful. Why were they successful? And what attracted us in terms of their interview that we can replicate again? So it just gives them a bit more of a focus scorecard that they can aim for in terms of the, uh, the interview process. So I said I'd talk a little bit about it being a candidate's market. So this is coming from LinkedIn's kind of talent trends in 2022. And they're focusing in on three main things. So one is all about flexibility. And uh, James from NetApp mentioned that a few minutes ago. When you think about it, workers want that more flexibility. You want to have flexible hours. You want to have a flexible work location. And when you look now today, you look at Airbnb and what Airbnb recently announced around the flexible work locations, they're allowing their employees to work anywhere in the world for a certain amount of time, and then they'll work and help them with the tax implications and everything else on top of that. The other two, one is around well-being. So I think, again, everyone wants to feel well. We don't want to be stressed at work. We don't want to have to think about health issues or anything at work. So that's a big, a big plus from an employer perspective. So they want you to do the same. So a lot of employers are offering that as part of what they're doing. But then it's a big benefit from an employer as well, because if you're not stressed, if you're not sick, you're, you're obviously working a lot more than you would have previously. And the last one is around culture. So again, everybody wants to work in a place where they fit in with the culture, whether it's from a technology perspective, whether it's from a diversity, whether it's part of your corporate social responsibility or you're giving back. You all want to be able to, uh, to fit in from that perspective. So interestingly enough, what are actually cost, uh, companies measuring? That's really the kind of the, the, the key thing here to understand. So, First one is just a simple one. It is average days to hire. So how long did it actually take us to hire the, the applicant? So starting the process all the way to the end. They want to make sure this is as short as possible. So again, any time they can reduce that number, it is beneficial. Candidate diversity. And this doesn't only apply to candidates in terms of as they're successful but it also applies to the actual number of resumes you get. So companies are now scoring themselves on how many applications they have are coming from diverse candidates. So again, from a diversity perspective, if you're applying for a STEM job and you're a diverse candidate, you definitely have an advantage over a lot of other candidates. So it's something to, to think about in terms of the companies that you're applying for. The cost per quality applicant, again, Everything's about efficiency. Everything's about trying to keep your costs low. So understanding how much it costs for you to get a, a to, to source a, a quality applicant can be a very important metric for them to, to maintain. Interviews per hiring decision. So how much time in terms of interviews did it take? How many rounds? How many candidates did you have to interview? So again, to see, are you narrowing it down enough? Are you getting the right, the right candidates the first time round? Overall experience, and this is definitely something new from a, a candidate perspective. So now I'm not sure if anybody here has experience of applying for jobs lately and doing applications and doing interviews. 
and maybe you're unsuccessful. So now companies will send you a, a, a quick survey to see how they did from, from the candidate's perspective. So you've got your chance to say, okay, what the experience was like. Was the hiring experience good? Was there something wrong with the hiring manager? Was the process good? So, and they then give themselves what they call an NPS or a net promoter score. And that net promoter score then tells them how they're being viewed because they want to understand that data, but they also want to control that data. So when you think about that from a company's perspective, if they're not asking and the candidate has had a bad experience, he's going to go, he or she is going to go on to Glassdoor and they're going to write about that bad experience. And then your Glassdoor metric, your NPS is going to go down. So companies want to be able to control that. They want to understand where they're failing in the process, and then ultimately they want to fix that. I'll build out the next few again. Quality of hire, again, to understand how good the hire was. So whether that's the person has completed their probation period, whether that's the person has been successful for a year or two, they will then again use that same information to determine who will be the right fit from, a, from a, a candidate perspective. Sourcing channel efficiency. So there's so many different ways to recruit today. So big ones are LinkedIn, Indeed.com, job fairs like today, job boards. So companies want to understand where they're getting the quality applications from. They want to understand where they're getting the talent pipeline from. So that's a big part of it. And the last one I'll mention is what they call the turnover propensity index. So that's looking to understand what their turnover is going to look like, what potential attrition is going to look like. Because it's a big thing from a recruitment perspective because if you're expecting 10% of your staff to leave, you're going to need to at least hire 10% next year. So it plays into your recruitment numbers and how you do things. So these are the big things that, that have changed in terms of the company psyche, in terms of hiring, in terms of recruitment. Very f first one is around fine tuning that TA process. So understanding the talent acquisition end to end, understanding where the bottlenecks are, understanding where the problems are, and fixing those all through the data and analytics that they're collecting. Focusing in on the sourcing channels. So again, thinking that LinkedIn is the best, job fairs are the best, they now have the metrics to understand which ones are giving them the best quality candidates so they can use that going forward. I mentioned the NPS. So companies have long had the employee NPS and a customer NPS, but now this candidate NPS is so important as well because, as I said earlier, they want to make sure they're not getting bad reviews on Glassdoor, that they're getting all the right information uh, first and so that they can fix it before it comes up on a more public site like Glassdoor. The interview panels are becoming more and more of a norm as well. So they would long have been in the public sector, but private companies are starting to use them a lot more as well. And they're using them a lot more because the time. So instead of having rounds and rounds of interviews, they're going to put you into a panel with three or four probably um, inter interviewers so to help you Everything is all done in one kind of one quick swoop, as to say. Again, you have to understand the panel interview process. You have to understand how they're all scoring it and kind of how they're all pulling it together. It's how you influence each one of them, not just one of those interviewers. New strategies. So again, whether that's from graduate hires, whether it's from job fairs. One of the other big ones is around kind of return to work. So where people would have taken a, a break from the job market for a number of years, whether it's to, to raise a family or some other personal things, but they're now coming back into the marketplace and companies are actively recruiting them and they will train them and they will bring them back into the marketplace again because your skills are still your skills. You might need to be refreshed in terms of some technology in some different areas, but your skills are still the same. And then predictive analytics. So again, we talked about the turnover propensity index. We also look at the, the likelihood to hire. That's another big one that, that companies are using to say, okay, in this job market, 
for this job role, what is the likelihood we're going to be successful in terms of uh, being able to hire? So for, from a candidate's perspective, what, what do you kind of take away from all this? I think the first one is use your network. I think everybody here has a network, whether it's colleagues, whether it's neighbors, family, classmates in college, all thing, good things to actually use. Because again, there's a war on talent out there, so companies are finding it harder and harder to recruit. So what are they doing? they're doubling their internal, bo internal referral bonuses. So instead of maybe three or 5,000, it ends up being six or 10,000 for depending on the level of the job. So if you've got a colleague in a company you'd like to go work for or a friend, give them your resume. You get the job, they might get 5,000, they might get 6,000 depending on what the referral bonus is. So make sure you're using your network to be able to, uh, to leverage that. Same thing about being prepared, so understanding the company, understanding the sector they're in, understanding if they're tr what they're trying to drive from a diversity and inclusion perspective. We saw what NetApp were pushing earlier from a diversity perspective. So again, a lot of the technology companies are having trouble hiring diverse candidates in the STEM market. So if you're a diverse candidate, definitely you should be looking at the STEM market to give yourself a better chance in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of being hired. Flexibility, again, as candidates, everybody wants flexibility, but the employers also want flexibility as well. They want to be able to schedule the interviews. They, if they're trying to get a panel interview together, that's taking maybe a HR person, uh, the hiring manager, a senior person as well, all to get in the room. So you have to be as flexible as you can because they're probably not doing that multiple times a day or multiple days in a week, they're doing that on certain occasions. So make sure if you are getting the opportunity that you're, you're being flexible with the, with the dates and the times. And the last one I'll say is giving and requesting feedback. So companies will request feedback through that NPS process and through the surveys, but also for a candidate, you have, an, uh, I was gonna say an, an obligation, but you have a right to yourself to actually request for feedback as well. So if you didn't get the job, it's okay to reach out to that recruiter and ask them and understand why you didn't get that job. They might be able to give you a couple of tips in terms of, oh, you mightn't have appeared enthusiastic, you mightn't have appeared knowledgeable enough in terms of the skill set they were looking for. But that's something you can then use for your next interview. So always take some learnings from your previous interviews into your, into your future interviews. And then, if the company hasn't asked uh, you for feedback and you've had a bad experience from the, from the hiring process, do give that feedback on Glassdoor. Companies do want to hear it. Obviously, it has to be truthful, in, but if it's candid, if there was something uh, you didn't like in terms of the hiring manager or in the process, in terms of the timing, you should feel free to actually put that up in Glassdoor so the company will see it because they do have people scanning Glassdoor for that type of feedback. So again, if they haven't asked for it, they'll get it through the back door from a, a different process and a different means. Okay, so that was everything from my perspective. Hopefully, give you a little bit of an insight in terms of how data and analytics is used in the interview process and some takeaways from that. So, thank you, and I'm, I'm here if there's any questions, if anybody wants to, to talk on anything else. Thanks very much.